Phenomena exist before it is named. Tafsir, usul e fiqh, fiqh, all of these kind of terminologies, even tasawwuf, they existed long before they were actually given that formal title. Just because it wasn't named the Mawlid, it doesn't mean it was actually uh, in existence uh, before that. Um, what I'm going to depend on primarily in this uh, program is a beautiful book that I stumbled across. It's called Tariq al-Ihtifal bi Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's written by an Egyptian scholar called Muhammad Khalid Sabit. And in the title it means Tariq al-Ihtifal bi Mawlid al-Nabi means the history of celebrating the Mawlid of our Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. It's a beautiful book, it's in Arabic, and what he does in this book, he charts the history of the Mawlid, and then in detail, the first part of the book is talking historically, and then he brings it bang up to date. And what he does in, in considerable detail, he talks about how in modern days, the Mawlid is celebrated in Egypt, Turkey, Pakistan, Sudan, Yemen, Tunisia, Morocco, Palestine, Jordan, Libya, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Malaysia, Ethiopia, Balkan states, Russia, Nigeria, Mali, Kenya, Spain, Ukraine, Holland, China, India, United Kingdom, Canada, France, Denmark, Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, Bulgaria, Italy, Ireland, Australia, Greece, Senegal, Indonesia, and the United States. So he's given individual chapters on all of those countries that I have mentioned. So proof, if any were needed, that the Mawlid is truly a universal, uh, universal event. The Prophet ﷺ said, Yadullahi ala al-jama'ah. That Allah's assistance and his hand is upon the jama'ah, meaning those who follow the majority. The Prophet ﷺ said, Len yajtami'a ummati ala dalala. That my ummah, they will never agree upon something which is misguidance. They will never come together on a matter which is uh, disputed, you could say. They will, the majority will always follow uh, what everybody adheres to, which is part of uh, Sunnah. And one final point I'll mention about this book, it's written a beautiful line at the uh, um, front, almost like a subtitle. And I think this perfectly epitomizes the whole point of the Mawlid. He writes in Arabic, مَنْ لَمْ يَفْرَحْ بِمُحَمَّدٍ لَمْ يَرَى فَرَحًا abada." Whosoever does not show happiness for the sake of Muhammad, he has never seen real happiness. Real happiness is the happiness for the Prophet If you cannot show happiness for the sake of Sayyidina Rasulullah, who done so much for you, then who are you going to show happiness for? So certainly I think this is a great line which uh, uh, epitomizes and symbolizes the whole purpose of the uh, Mawlid. Um, so I'm going to give you three or four historical accounts of how the Mawlid started, so we can have an idea of where we can actually trace it back. And when I mean that, I mean in a formal sense. In a sense where the state, for example, would be sponsoring it. I'm not talking about individual Mawlids that you perhaps might see in the homes. We're talking about uh, the Mawlid en masse. We're talking in a, a, in a very uh, large scale. Then the second part of the program, I'm going to look at the Hijaz in particular, meaning the Saudi Peninsula. That let us have a look over the ages about how the Mawlid, or whether it was actually marked in the Saudi Peninsula, in Mecca and in Medina in particular. Today, unfortunately, they have a very different stance, but let us look historically as to how they actually treated the uh, uh, Mawlid. And then, inshallah ta'ala, we will conclude with some words about the Mawlid today and how it is marked throughout the uh, Islamic uh, world. But to begin with then, we will talk about the first real account of the Mawlid. The, the Fatimids, they ruled Egypt from the middle of the 4th Islamic century until the end of the 6th Islamic century. For most parts, and there's no disagreement in this, the Fatimids, they were Shias. And so they controlled large parts of Egypt and large parts of North Africa. During this period, certainly there are many reports which suggest that they commemorated the Mawlid al-Nabi alayhi salatu so, for example, there is a very famous uh, historian, his name is Al-Makrizi, in the year 517, that's the Islamic uh, uh, date, he says and he witnessed firsthand as to how the Shias and how the Muslims of the Fatimid era, uh, the, the state would distribute food, they would give sadaqah to people, and they would give the money to the trustees of the Mizars, for example. So the first real account that we have 
about the Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes from that early period and as you can see we are only talking about 300 odd years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, passed away. Another uh, report um, is taken uh, from the Fatimid era is that sweets would be distributed. All people would gather at Al-Azad University which is the, perhaps the oldest uh, university in the Islamic world. Um, then they would proceed to the government palaces, listen to speeches. But um, one observer, Dr. Abdul Munayma Sultan, he notes that for most part, these celebrations, they were Shia in nature. So for some observers and some academics, the Mawlid, it actually has Shia uh, heritage. The origins of it are to be, uh, you could say, from the Shia, not from the Sunnis. However, the author of this book, and certainly other mainstream scholars, they assert that you cannot say that the Shias were the first pioneers of the Mawlid al-Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. Yes, they did celebrate it. But we are not going to call them the pioneers of it. We cannot say that the Mawlid actually comes from the uh, Shias. Number one, why? Because the celebrations were more about the Shia beliefs than they were about Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. In reality, it was a more of a propaganda, you could say, to promote their own beliefs. So they used the Mawlid as a vehicle, you could say, to promote their own political and sectarian ideas. That is what commentators have said. The second point to mention on that is that they commemorated every single birth and every single important event, most of them relating to the Ahlul Bayt and most of them related to the Shia beliefs. I'll give you an, an, an idea of that. At that time, in the Fatimid period, the Shias, they would, uh, the, they would also celebrate New Year's Eve. They would also celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam. The birthday of, birthday of Sayyidina Ali, karram Allahu wa shahu. The birthday of Sayyidina Hassan. The birthday of Sayyidina Hussein. The birthday of Sayyidina Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Whoever was the current caliph of the time, they would celebrate his uh, birthday as well. Um, Yawm Ghadir Khum. This is an important day for the Shias. What that is, is, if you don't know the background to that, is that the Prophet he was returning from one of his battles. And on the way back, um, there was some small <coughs> dispute and some people questioned the authority of Sayyidina Ali Karram Allahu Wajhahu. And on that day, the day of, uh, which is celebrated in Ghadir Khum, and that is the place where it happened, uh, the Prophet famously said, Man kuntu mawlahu fa aliyun mawlahu. That uh, who, um, whoever for, for Ali is the, the Mawla, the leader, then I am his leader as well. Meaning I adhere to whatever Ali adheres to as well. For the Shia, this is a very important saying. For them, they've extended that. And they've suggested that this gives authority to Sayyidina Ali over Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar and Usman radiallahu ta'ala and Umar. So they, they gave importance to this day. Even in this day and age, the Shias, they believe in uh, Yawm al-Khadir Khum. Uh, they celebrated uh, fanatically uh, almost. So as you can see, they celebrated every single event, whoever's birthday it was. And yes, amongst that was Mawlid nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So can you say that they celebrated Mawlid specifically to the exclusion of others? No, you can't. At that time, they were doing it with a lot of other uh, events, and most of them were uh, Shia uh, events. It, it fell on the hands of Salahuddin Ayyubi, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi. He put an end to Fatimid rule in Egypt and the surrounding areas. One of the first things he did as a Sultan is that he also put an end to the numerous celebrations that the Shias were indulging. So he had a calendar in front of him, you could say, and he basically went through the list of the Shia events and he basically got rid of them. He eradicated them all. But when he came to the Mawlid al-Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, he maintained that. Why did he maintain that? Because he saw that not as a Shia event, he saw that as a Sunni event. In terms, uh, who was Salahuddin Ayyubi? In terms of Mazhab, he was a Shafi'i. In terms of Aqidah, he was Ash'ari. In terms of spirituality, he was a Sufi. So he, rightly so, he promoted the Mawlid al-Nabi that the Fatimid were indulging in, and again, rightly so, he put an end to the numerous Shia events that they were also indulging, indulging in as well. Why is this first example important? Why would I start with the Shia example? 
um, I, I don't want to shortchange people. I want people to know the whole picture as well. You know, as an academic, I, I like to give both sides of the argument. I don't want to, you know, I want you to explain. People will tell you sometimes that, yes, you celebrate the Mawlid, but don't you know that this is a Shia event? I want you to be aware of why they say that and where they've actually taken that from. Equally, I want you to give the other side, you to be equipped with the other side as well, to understand why they say this and why it's wrong to assert that it is a Shia event. So please, do not fall into this trap of people telling us that you commemorate the Mawlid, why are you commemorating something which the Shias indulged in? As you can see now, historically, there are reasons why they indulged in it, and importantly, it was Salahuddin Ayyubi who put that right. Today, again, people are using the same kind of propaganda to put people off the Mawlid. This year, subhanAllah, we're very uh, blessed in the year 2015, it's the year of the Mawlidain. There's two Mawlids in this year. We've had one in January, and Alhamdulillah, we're having one in December as well. And as it stands at the moment, uh, the actual date, the 12th of Rabi'il Awwal, it seems will fall on the 24th. It might even fall on Christmas Day. It might fall on the uh, 25th, and what a great coincidence that is. Um, again, unfortunately, although I mean, I'm happy that this, the dates coincide, what might happen is, is that people with petty minds, they might compare the two now. And say, well, look, there's Christmas lights everywhere, and there's uh, Christmas trees outside, and there's uh, all this fancy tins uh, tinsel. Uh, the Christmases are doing, having their due. You're doing exactly the same. What difference is there between you and the Christians now? And then you might hear people say, Man bikawmin fa huwa minhum. That, that don't you know that the Prophet wasallam said that whoever resembles a community, he becomes like them. You know, our uh, Mawlid is very, very different to the uh, Christmas celebrations. Our Mawlids happen in, in the right places, they happen with the right intention, and they happen like we had in beautiful Nasheed, uh, with the right uh, um, uh, mood as well. It's always coming back to Allah and His Messenger. Uh, Christmas, unfortunately, day by day, is becoming more of a, uh, a, a consumer event. That is, it's become uh, basically... Uh, about shopping. Um, each and every year we, we hear more about Boxing Day sales, New Year sales, Black Friday sales, rather than any idea of compassion. You know, when I was younger, that uh, when I used to turn on the TV at Christmas time, there was always talk about helping others. Local news would be about how we've helped the homeless over the festive period. We always hear about how people would help the, visit hospitals and give presents. I don't see that in the news anymore. And, uh, you know, uh, as a Muslim, I, I'm, I'm worried about that. I think that we, Christmas is uh, slowly disappearing. If Christmas disappears, it means religion disappears. And it means that secularization is setting in and capitalism wins. So I would advise the Christians, by all means, is that leave Christmas as a religious event. Come back or maybe the Christians could learn from what we're doing this year. That just like you, yes, that we do share a common thread that we are marking the birth of our prophet. But take a note from how we do it. We do it in the religious places. We do it when we ensure that there is no uh, free mixing, that there is no indecency, that there is nothing fahish about our <coughs> celebrations. And that's very important that a molded is only a molded when it's actually marked in the correct manner. So it's important that I started with this example so you understand where other people might object, and so that you can equip yourself with the uh, answer to it. We're going to move forward now. We come to the time of uh, an individual called Sheikh Umar al-Mullah, who lived at the end of the 6th century. He lived in the time of a great <coughs> leader whose name was Nuruddin Mahmud. Nuruddin Mahmud himself, he was a great pious leader, who subhanAllah was often compared to the great Caliph Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar bin Abdul Aziz lived at the end of the first Islamic century and he came from the progeny from the family of Sayyidina Umar anhu. And he's often called the fifth caliph of Islam because of his piety and because he was a reflection of the four rightly guided caliphs. So with Nuruddin, a lot of comparisons were made with Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He loved the ulama ikram. He kept their company all of the time. Sheikh Umar Mullah, he was a Sufi Muslim who had written many works and the biography of the Prophet Ali, and each year at the time of Rabi'ul Awwal, 
He gave the Mawlid great importance, inviting the rich and poor, the dignitaries, the poets, and the scholars. And they would hold methods, they would hold gatherings, and they would mark the Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Abu Shama, a historian and an observer of that time, he said that he would hold a gathering each year during the days of the birth of the messenger peace be upon him, inviting the people of Mosul in Iraq. Poets would attend to praise the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad Khalid Sabit, in this book here, he identifies <coughs> Sheikh Umar al-Mullah as the first real Sunni Sufi pioneer of the Mawlid in a formal and state manner. <coughs> Meaning state-sponsored. Where it would be a public affair, not just a private affair. That for the first time that Mawlid was really on the map and it was really a, a, an important date in the calendar for everyone involved in the state. So this is the first uh, point where it was officially and formally celebrated. After that, and we come to the time of uh, Sultan Muzaffar uh, of uh, Erbil, this is uh, uh, only a few years later. He lived in the time of Salahuddin Ayyubi. Again, much has been written, and many scholars have actually pinpointed him as the first to uh, mark the Mawlid. Who was he? He was a pure-hearted, brave and wise uh, ruler. He was the, one of the first to turn the Mawlid into a formal uh, event. He was rich. There's no doubt about that. But he spent on his people and his subjects. Each and every year, he would spend 300,000 dinars annually on the Mawlid. And then, subhanAllah, additionally, he, he also spent money in actually helping the Muslims uh, uh, across the borders as well. 200,000 dinars would be put aside to spend on releasing Muslim prisoners held by the Europeans. Even in this day and age, and I've heard this in, in Pakistan in particular, Nawaz Sharif uh, has been an exponent of this in the past, uh, who's uh, the, for, um, the current Prime Minister, he had a stint uh, before as well in the 90s. On the occasion of Mawlid nabi a lot of prisoners who are about to be released anyway, who, or, or, or who are seen as uh, not dangerous to the general public, a lot of prisoners, they are released on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awal in Pakistan in this day and age as well. Where have they got that idea from? They've got that idea from Sultan al muzaffar So he would release, uh, he would basically pay ransom uh, for many of the uh, prisoners that were abroad, prisoners of war basically. Um, also, he used to look after the Haramain as well. Remember, at that time it was very difficult getting to Makkah and Medina Sharif. He would spend 300,000 dinars on looking after the Haram Sharifs, and he would provide roots, water, and food along the roots as well. Unbelievably rich, yet his own wife said that he would never wear a garment more than five dirhams. So, alhamdulillah, in the past we, do, we did have leaders who, who thought about their subjects more than their own uh, pocket. Uh, this is the era as well which also led to the first publication on the Mawlid. There was uh, one individual called Hafiz Abu al-Khattab ibn Dihya. Um, he passed by uh, Irbil in 654 uh, Hijra. And he saw the celebrations of the Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in order to mark that, he wrote a book called Kitab al-Tanweer fi Mawlid al-Bashir al-Nazir. And he was gifted 1,000 dinars for his efforts by Sultan al muzaffar So this is just prior to the Middle Ages. Here now we see that people for the first time were writing in particular on the Mawlid al-Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. Also this period was marked by acts of generosity, acts of diplomacy. And certainly, like we should be the case with all Mawlid, that there was an in particular uh, um, uh, um, attention to the poor, the underprivileged, to those people who needed the help most. It was not an elite party. It was not to the exclusion of everyone and only for the few. Rather, it was a very public event and as much as possible, it kept people uh, busy in that. Uh, Sultan Muzaffar, you will find a lot of the scholars, a lot of our uh, um, uh, Asian scholars as well, they pinpoint him. Ibn Kasir, if you look in al Bidaya when he hire, he has a brilliant entry about Sultan Muzaffar. He speaks highly about him and he speaks about the good work that he uh, did as well. So he is considered as one of the early pioneers of the uh, Mawlid. Uh, the second section now, look at the uh, Mawlid in the Hijaz, modern day Saudi Arabia. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that the Mawlid al-Nabi was definitely part and parcel 
of the uh, climate and atmosphere of Makkah and Medina Sharif. It's only stopped very recently, meaning in 1914 or, or, or the likes. Otherwise, up until that point, certainly the Mawlid al-Nabi was marked in the uh, Hijaz. I will give you five or six accounts of the Mawlid al-Nabi in Makkah and Medina uh, Sharif. The first one that I came across in the 6th century Islamic uh, uh, Hijra. Ibn Jubair, uh, again a very famous historian, uh, he wrote a uh, book, um, Rihad. Rihad means traveling. Remember, and we're going to talk about this later, we're going to mention Ibn uh, Battuta. At that age, traveling had a purpose. Most of the time people learned during their travels. You know, people spoke highly about traveling from one place to another. People had very, you know, they had very detailed diaries. Uh, Ibn Khuldun is obviously another great example about w what they saw, who they met, and the climate and the, the places that they went to. Today, unfortunately, traveling is just, let's get from A to B as quickly as possible. Uh, be honest with you, the last time that you were sitting on a plane, when did you even bother speaking to the guy or the girl sitting next to you? You know, you just worried that, I hope, He's not too big, or she's too big, and I hope she doesn't put the chair down, or I hope that he or she doesn't get agitated every time I have to go to the bathrooms. We want to keep our contacts at minimum. The last time you were in London, did you, anyone ever see anyone speak on the underground? You know, in the past, people used their traveling experiences to actually learn as much as possible. Uh, it's unfortunate that today we don't see traveling and suffer in that same light. Our Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, he had some brilliant guidance on Safar. What to do, how many people to go with, even what day to leave, what dua to read when you leave. Uh, there's a reason for that, because Safar for many people was a very, very important part of their life. It was life-changing for them. So we're very lucky that we have accounts like uh, Ibn Jubairs, which tell us so much about the Middle Ages. If they were like us, and they said, please, Camel, get me to this place as soon as possible, then I'm sorry, we would lose a lot of history. We would lose a lot of our civilization. But we have the likes of Ibn Battuta. We have the likes of Ibn Khaldun, who traveled vastly, but more importantly, they kept a very detailed account about what they saw and what they actually uh, did. Um, he writes that the blessed house of our Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, on this particular occasion of the Mawlid, it was open. All men would enter into it and they would take blessings from it. This would happen to every Monday during the month of Rabi al-Awwal. And then on that day, uh, as well, there would be extra celebrations, the 12th of uh, Rabi al-Awwal. Uh, you know very well that the Mawlidun Nabi alayhi salatu was salam. Uh, Mawlid is an Arabic word. It means time or place of birth. <coughs> so for large part, Mawlid is some zarf. Um, so for the large part, when we use the word Mawlid, it means time of celebrating his birth. Mawlid also means place of birth as well. So on that basis, Mawlid means the place that our Prophet ﷺ was born. So that place now is a uh, library. It is very, it's in between Safa and Marwa. Uh, right now it's an extension, uh, um, it's, a, it's, it's a construction site, you could say. Uh, there were talks about uh, destroying uh, it. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah is still intact. You can still uh, visit that place in this day and age as uh, well. That's the 6th century. Coming to the 7th century and the 8th century, Ibn Battuta, again a great traveler and historian, he writes that on every Friday and on the birthday of the Prophet, the door of the Kaaba was opened by Banu Shaiba. Banu Shaiba were the custodians from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Mawlid, uh, on the Mawlid itself, the head church, the Qazi of Makkah, he would distribute food uh, to the people, to the noble and to the poor people of Makkah Shiri. Again, that the Mawlid came into it and it was celebrated at the Kaaba Sharif as well. Coming to the 10th century, there are, these are accounts uh, given by esteemed uh, scholars, including Ibn uh, Hajar al-Haysami. I'll read some of those accounts. Uh, the first one, this is written by Ibn Hajar al-Haysami. Each year on the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal, after the evening prayer, the four Qadis of Makkah, representing the four Sunni schools, and large people, including the Fuqaha, the Fudala, the Sheikhs, the students, the magistrates, the scholars, they would leave the mosque and set out collectively for a visit to the birthplace of the Prophet <coughs> shouting out Allahu Akbar, shouting out La ilaha illallah. So in this day and age, we have a julus, you could say, a procession. A lot of the major cities in this country and indeed abroad as well, they will have processions 
uh, from one mosque to another, for example. This is taken from uh, the journey that would take place from the Kaaba Sharif to the Mawlid al-Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is not something which uh, you could say has happened from the Indian subcontinent. This is something which is taken directly from the uh, Hijaz. What would happen en route? Uh, the houses en route are eliminated with numerous lanterns, large candles, and many people would come out in the streets. They would wear special clothes. They would take their children with them. Having reached the birthplace inside, a special sermon on the occasion of the Prophet Ali would be delivered, mentioning the different karamats and miracles that took place on that occasion. And then the Sultan, he would perform a collective dua, the Amir of Makkah and the, the Shafi'i uh, Qadi, they would also pray for the betterment of the Ummah as well. So you could say that in, in shape and form, nothing has really changed over the last, you could say, eight, um, 400 years. That today, we, you know, we'll come into the streets and perform a uh, procession. They did it then as well. People today will come out in their best clothes and bring their children to make sure that they understand what the Mawlid is about. <coughs> they would do that then as well. Food would be distributed. They would do that as uh, well. Dignitaries and the ulama would be involved in these processions and in, the, in these uh, gatherings. Again, nothing has really uh, changed. Then on the night of the Mawlid, uh, I'll read to you what actually used to happen from Ibn Hajar, uh, what used to happen on the night of the Mawlid, uh, staying in Makkah. Surely before the night prayer, the whole party returns from the birthplace of the Prophet ﷺ to the Kaaba Shari, which is almost overcrowded. All sit down in rows at the foot of the maqam ibrahim In the mosque, a preacher first mentions the tamheed, the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and once again the du'as for the sultan, the amir, the qazi would be performed. After this, the, the call for the night prayer is made, and after the prayer, the crowd disperses. Importantly, what you understand from this is that the Mawlidun Nabi, the night of it, the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal, was a time of ibadat. The night prayer we were talking about is the Tahajjud prayer. So, along with the celebrations, along with the genuine happiness and joy and elation that people would have on this occasion, at the same time it was a time for supplication as well. It was a time for dua as well. It was a time to pray for the betterment of the Muslim Ummah. Again, this is something that we can learn as well. It's not just frills, it's not just joys and lanterns and lights. It's about the time for supplication as well. It's a time for uh, deep reflection, it's a time for zikr uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and salawat upon the best of all uh, creation. Coming to the 11th century in Medina Sharif now, Mullah Ali Qari, a great Hanafi scholar, uh, he wrote a brilliant commentary on uh, Mishkatul Masabi, which is uh, readily available, which is used very often in our Darul Ulooms. It certainly is a point of authority for our Hanafi scholars. He writes uh, um, in, uh, from Medina Sharif, that Muslims would regularly attend Mawlid gatherings with great enthusiasm and sincerity. In detail, I've only kept it very short, but he, he mentions, subhanAllah, in great detail about how the place of Medina Shari would be illuminated by the, the Mawlid al Nabi celebrations. And that how it would form a very important occasion for everyone uh, involved. The 12th century, uh, we will come to a great scholar who I'm sure you are familiar with, Jafar bin uh, Hassan al Barzanji. He uh, was born in the year 1128 and passed away in 1177, one of the greatest scholars of Medina Sharif. He took his education from Medina Sharif and he excelled brilliantly as a student. By the age of 31, he was delivering lectures in Masjid al Nabawi, which uh, even by today's standards is very, very young. He taught hadith, tafsir, fiqh, usul fiqh, sarf, Nahab, Ilm Kalam, Akida, as long with many other disciplines. Although he was a Shafi'i himself, he was such an expert in fiqh that he was able to give decrees and fatwas for all of the four mazhabs. This gives an indication of his expertise in fiqh. What do we most fam famously know him uh, for? Uh, he's most famously known for a beautiful book called Iqt al Jawhar fi Mawlid al Nabi al Azhar, which is famously known as the Mawlid al Barzanji. Even today in this country, that there are many gatherings, especially in the homes, where people will recite the Mawlid al Barzanji. If you hear amongst uh, the people in the coming weeks and months about a mehfil, about a gathering of the Mawlid al Barzanji, please attend. It's a beautiful uh, uh, poem, it's a beautiful uh, um, 
dedication to our Prophet والسلام, certainly it has many spiritual benefits as well. A lot of the uh, maulids, you could say they are very particular to a certain area. People, for example, of the Far East, they will uh, um, take on the maulid or take on the nuts and the sheets of their particular scholars. <coughs> the people from the Indian subcontinent, they will talk about their own scholars. The Egyptians, they will talk highly of their own uh, scholars. But subhanAllah, the, the Maulid of Al-Barzanji is one of those universally acclaimed works where people from Indonesia, people from United States, people from India, Pakistan, they would certainly have uh, heard of these uh, works. Uh, coming to the uh, 13th century, closer now, uh, we come to another very, uh, famous scholar, uh, Sheikh Yusuf uh, bin Ismail al Nabahani. Uh, Nabahani was a, living in a very troubled time. He lived uh, at a time where <coughs> colonialism was taking uh, force in India, in Pakistan, and indeed, indeed in the Middle East as well. At the same time, simultaneously, Nabahani, just like Allah Hazrat Fazli Barilbi Rahmatullah in India, he faced the problem of Wahhabism. That the first wave of Wahhabism uh, thanks to Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab Najdi at the beginning of the 19th century. It was, unfortunately, it was uh, finding footage in Egypt, it was finding uh, footage in the Saudi Peninsula and in North Africa. It was the Sufi Al-Gram uh, and the likes of Muhammad Ali Basha in Egypt who defeated the Wahhabi movement in terms of military force. This had happened in the 19th century. So when it comes to fighting them physically, uh, Muhammad Ali Basha and his army, they were instrumental, along with the Naqshbandis behind them, to fight them. Once they were defeated, then there was an academic war, you could say, to defeat Wahhabism and to defeat extremism. Certainly, an Nabahani was instrumental and pivotal in that movement. He wrote many books in which, without any deviation, I'll tell you, that he directly tackled some of the objections and some of the propaganda that were raised by the Wahhabi movement in the 19th century. So many of his uh, books, Shawahid al-Haq, Shawahid al-Bihar and so forth, still readily available in this day and age. They tackled the uh, extremism of Wahhabism in those books. Um, coming to what he had to say about the uh, Mawlid al-Nabi, Ali uh, salatu uh, he said that on the eve of the Mawlid, the people living in Makkah, they would go to the birthplace of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in uh, huge numbers. Again, in detail, uh, he used to uh, talk about how that for Makkah it became a very special occasion. He actually wrote that it was just as important as the other Eids as well. A day of great elation, a great, of, uh, uh, great ecstasy and joy. And his accounts, they certainly give the impression that this was an event which was sanctioned by the state of that time as well that the Saudi authority or the Hijazi authority, they had no problem with that whatsoever. So this is just, an, the only reason I gave you this is because in this day and age, again it comes back to uh, some of the objections and, and that people will say today, they say, well, if Maulid is so important, why isn't Makkah and Medina doing it? You know, Makkah and Medina is the center of Islam. These are the most two important cities in our village and undoubtedly they are. That you know, if they're not doing it, if they're not sanctioning it, then I don't see why we should do it, be doing it. Some people do argue on that line. And my point is, is that it's only been a very, very short period that the Maulid hasn't been marked in the Hijaz. And year upon year, account after account, it seems very strong that the Maulid is coming back in Makkah and Medina Sharif. That there used to be a time where the Mutawwas, Mutawwa is the name we give for the uh, uh, Islamic fort police, you could say. Uh, I think Big Brother, you could say. Uh, the Mutawwas, they were very strong when it came to the 12th of Rabi Allah, they would ensure that no celebration would take place in Makkah Sharif, outside the Kaaba, and that there would be no celebrations outside the Green Dome in Medina Sharif. And they were very successful at that, especially, especially when I was young and uh, uh, we tried to do Mawlids. But day, year upon year, it's getting more and more difficult for them to stop it. And it's becoming much more of a public affair, and they're almost resigned to the fact that people, uh, locals in particular, and people who are coming for the Umrah, 
uh, there's nothing that they can do to actually stop people from mocking the Mawlid al-Nabi uh, in the heart of Islam, in Makkah Sharif and in uh, Medina Sharif. Coming to today now, uh, this is information which has been supplied by the Department of Awqaf in the United Arab Emirates. In this day and age, these are countries that have a public holiday. So just like we have New Year's Day, just like we have Christmas Day, these are countries that have a public holiday where all offices, all banks and all uh, official places will be shut. So you can see from there how many African countries have uh, uh, celebrations on the Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So subhanAllah, the, the, the Africa is green with the celebrations of the Mawlid al-Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam. Coming to the Middle East, there's only three countries that aren't celebrating it. <coughs> Otherwise, in each and every of these countries, they are celebrating it officially, meaning it is an official holiday. The only exceptions are Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen. And again, and I, I want to stress that point, we are talking formally. We are talking about state-backed. Uh, in Qatar, in Saudi Arabia, and in Yemen, privately, it is being celebrated. Uh, certainly, if you need proof for that, then go into social media on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awal. And I'm certain, I'm, I am sure that you will come across many accounts of the Mawlid being celebrated in Mecca and in uh, Medina Shiri. Uh, also in Asia, uh, again, we have a long list of countries that officially mark the Mawlid al-Nabi, alayhi salatu wa salam. We have countries like Fiji and Guyana as well. Fiji and Guyana aren't even Muslim countries. And they're marking the Mawlid al-Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa salam. Sri Lanka is not a Muslim country. And yet they have a public holiday on that. Uh, so subhanAllah, even, um, you know, it's their benevolence, you could say, and uh, we're grateful for it, that even they mark this uh, occasion as uh, well. So a total of 47 countries officially recognize the Mawlid as a public holiday, and India, Sri Lanka, Fiji, Guyana, Tanzania, Mali, and many others, they are not even dominant Muslim countries. And yet they still mark the Mawlid in Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, it comes back to what I said about traveling. The whole point of travelling is to understand the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fasiru fil ard, travel the earth. And the whole point is to open your eyes up. If you just live in England, or a, a typical person living in Lahore, or a pe person in Karachi, or in, or in Kuala Lumpur even, if he stays there all of his life, he's going to imagine that Muslims are only what, I'm, what we do as Muslims. And a lot of our Pakistanis and a lot of our Indians, they get the impression that Oh, it's a Pakistani thing. It's just an Indian thing. You know, this Mawlid and this Milad that we do, it's just a, it's just a, a, a local thing. And it's only when you travel, it's only when you get on the plane or get on the boat or get on the train that you actually appreciate that Islam is much bigger than that. You know, let's face it, for you and I, getting, getting to Hajj is not difficult. You know, it's... Let's put it into perspective. I mean, if, if we say that the Hajj nowadays is, you know, rounded up to four thousand pounds, for most of us, you know, that's maybe four 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 months' salary. You know, for some of you, it might be a month's salary. I don't know, but you know, for most of you, it's it's not much. People living in the poorer areas of the world, how much do they have to save up to go on the Hajj? It's not four months' salary, is it? It'd be more like four years' salary. But Allah makes it incumbent upon every single person to go on the Hajj at least once in their lifetime. That if you can't afford it, make sure you go there. And the whole purpose behind it, and my understanding of it is, is that wherever you're from in the world, until you go to Makkah and Medina Shri, you're only going to think that it's only my colored skin people who are Muslims. It's only people who speak Punjabi that are Muslims. It's only people who are Arabs who are Muslims. The whole point of the Hajj is for you to appreciate, you know something, it's bigger. Islam is bigger than all of humanity put together. That I'm doing tawaf with a black Muslim next to me. I'm doing a tawaf next to a person who can't speak, a, who's speaking in a language I've never heard of. You know, so this idea of melting pot, we've forgotten it. And it's only when you travel and appreciate the other cultures and the Hajj for us is that most important part. If you understand that Islam is truly universal. I will say exactly the same for the Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not think for one moment that it's a local phenomena. Do not think that it's just a Pakistani thing. It's not. It's absolutely universal. 
And just a very brief indication of that, I just bought some, uh, a couple of pictures of how it's marked uh, throughout the Muslim uh, world. And these are just simple pictures uh, that I brought along. And you can show how much love and affection that people uh, mark the Mawlud in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Bangladesh here. We have hundreds of thousands taken to the street to mark the Mawlud in Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. In India, we're familiar with what they do there, certainly. Uh, those who have been in uh, Pakistan uh, over this uh, period certainly will tell you how special it is. Uh, this is a, an, an a, a older picture. Um, the, the celebrations in Egypt are quite typical uh, like that as well. That what you'll find is that there's different silsilas and tariqas. And you know that you have the Chishtiya Odiya and the Naqshbandiya Odiya. They will all amass together. Uh, and they'll come to Masjid Hussein in Cairo. And there's no... SubhanAllah, it's, it's a beautiful uh, of, um, of a sight. Is that each and every um, silsila, they'll be dressed with their own clothing, you could say. But they will come together. And they'll have their duffs. And, and they'll march through the streets and, and they'll walk through the city centre as, uh, uh, as well. Uh, Malawi as well, uh, again in Africa, is a great event as well. Uh, in, again in Sudan, uh, I have many friends who, who again, in, uh, who talk about how brilliant um, this event is in uh, uh, their country as well, in Malawi uh, as well. In Egypt, and I saw this first time, the whole month is taken up by the Rabi'ul Awal celebrations. There'll be competitions. Uh, the most famous competition, and uh, when I was there, it was uh, Husni Mubarak, who was the uh, president. They used to have different competitions. So who could uh, recite the Qur'an and memorize it the best? And there would be absolutely humongous, enormous prizes. Hundreds of thousands of guineas um, prizes for those people who were best in Hifas. And the president himself would give the prizes in the month of Rabi al Awwal. Whereas before, um, you could say that Egypt is the, is the cultural center of the Middle East. Egypt is known to produce its soaps and dramas. You know, like you've got Coronation Street and EastEnders here. Well, Egypt, you could say, is the center of that uh, for the whole of the Middle East, that they would export their soaps. In the month of Rabi al Awwal, the only thing that uh, Egypt will export is religious soaps and dramas. So there will be reenactments of famous his, um, Islamic characters. And throughout the month of Rabi al Awwal, all you would see is uh, remakes of uh, you know, programs related to Islam. And it's a great occasion. Uh, so certainly in Egypt, from my own experience, they certainly uh, took it uh, on board. To conclude, um, the 6th century marked the beginning of state-funded, I think that's the key word, modern commemorations in a formal manner. So that means the like of uh, um, uh, Sultan al muzaffar and it means uh, before that as well in the form of Nuruddin uh, as well. When I mean state-funded, it means publicly. It means that the government is putting money into it. It means that it's a public affair, not a private affair. Do not think for one moment that that means it took 600 years for the Mawlid to be commemorated. It was, but it wasn't given that name. Every single one of the companions of the Prophet Ali Salatu was Salam were Sufis. But we never gave them that name. All of them were experts in, uh, you could say, in Tafsir. But we never called them in Mufassir. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu knew, reported 6,000 traditions. We don't call him a muhaddis though, do we? These terminologies came later. So everything existed, whether it was fiqh, whether it was usul fiqh, and the example I gave at the beginning, tawheed as a discipline. ilm kalam aqidah, sarf, nahar. All of these things, they existed right from the beginning, from the onset of Islam. We gave its name later. Do not think that because the name came later, that it didn't exist. Right from the beginning, what came first? Did the object come first or did the names come first? وَأَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا The first episode that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught to Sayyidina Adam, He showed him the objects first. And then He named them. He said, هَذَا كِتَابٌ هَذَا كُرْسِيٌ هَذَا كَلَمٌ So what does that teach you then? It, that symbolically teaches you that something can exist before you give its name. <coughs> and that happens with everything, doesn't it? So why is it so difficult to believe that now with Mawlidun Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam? 
It existed right from the beginning. We never gave it that name. In exactly the same way Usuli Pik existed, although we never gave it uh, that uh, name. The second point, this is very important, it's very wrong to assert that the Mawlid is a Shia event. We started with that, we will make very clear that yes, they did celebrate it, but they were celebrating it as part of marking all of the events related to the Ahlul Bayt. They marked the birthday of everyone and anyone, let's face it, even their own caliph. They did not mark out Mawlidun Nabi in particular. It was Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi who came along and when he took over Egypt and the surrounding areas and put an end to the Fatima dynasty, that he uh, eradicated and uh, put aside all of the Shia events and their uh, celebration, he maintained the Mawlid alayhi salatu was salam. Why did he do that? Because he saw that as a Sunni uh, event. And then finally, the last point is that the Mawlid is always marked by acts of generosity and virtue. Not by fahish. Not by fighting. Mawlid by nature is about muhabbat. It's about uh, trying as much as possible to bring compassion, unity amongst people. That is why the likes of Sultan Muzaffar would try to free prisoners on this occasion. That's why as much as possible that they would try to treat the poor in the same way as well. One final point, and inshallah ta'ala our next guest is uh, here, alhamdulillah, is that, you know, sometimes people think that, you know, with, with this current state of uh, Muslim affairs, and let's face it, we're living in a very, very uh, difficult period, People might say that, look, you know these Sufi Muslims, they've lost the plot. Syria is being bombarded to death. We have Daesh who are ripping the very basics of our religion. Then on the other side, we have apologetic Muslims who, who are another extremist, I would say. Who are basically saying that we need to change Islam to suit what, the, uh, what the David Cameron wants. We need to change the apostasy laws. We need to change the laws about women and their role in the mosque, and maybe we should let them lead the prayers. We need to change the rule about how we look at heterosexuality and homosexuality. And there are Muslims who, you know, very nice in appearance, nicely clean and shaved, lovely Ted Baker suits, advise the government on this issue. And they want to rip up Islam. So right now we have two extremes, you could say. We have Daesh, who have basically ripped apart the very essence of our religion, the very essence of Rahmatullahi Alameen Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And on the other hand, we have people who think that Islam is the problem and not Muslims. And they want to try to reform Islam. I'll remind those people that the last people to try to do that was in the 19th century. His name was Sayyid Qutb. And that led to the Ikhwan movement in Egypt, which we are still paying the price for today. They were reformists as well. So in this day and age, in this climate, people might ask that you have two problems, two major problems, both extremists, and yet you're just putting the lights out and bringing people together for the Mawlid? There are more pressing uh, concerns, people might argue, than celebrating the birth of the Prophet Get on and start engaging with the government. Get on and try to, try to stop this extremism. Get on with real work. They might argue that this Mawlid nabi and, and these, all of these uh, Nats and Nashid that you are performing and these uh, Mawlid that you are reciting, what is the point behind that? We're living in troubled times. To that I simply say that, I say that at this moment in time, there is no greater antidote, there is no greater antithesis to what Daesh is doing than the Mawlid nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. If anything, the need of the Mawlid is more important in this day and age than ever before. Because Mawlid represents a simple word, love. That's what it's really about. It's just about muhabbat, nothing else. And Daesh in this moment in time, they represent nothing but hate. The only way that you can actually dissolve this narrative of Daesh is by getting rid of this whole you know, vocabulary of hate, of separation, of divide. It's only the Sufis can do that. It's only you and I that can actually do that. The extremist, when a non-Muslim is about to die, he, he, always, sees, he always sees the world as a, a dichotomy, as a duality. It's the Muslims versus the Kafirs. It's the blessed versus the damned. It's the, it's the axis of evil, you could say, and those people who support it. The extremists, they try to divide the world. 
The Sufis, they bring people together. They remind people, no, we're not divided. We're all the children of Adam, alayhi salam. We just diverted along the way. The extremist, when a non-Muslim is about to die, he, he starts dancing on his grave. Another one bites the dust. Another one ending up in the fire of hell. The Sufi, on the other hand, when a non-Muslim is about to die, let's see if you can read, make him read the kalima. Let's see if you can change his fate at the last moment. Sufis bring people together. And there is no greater vacant, I think, which is universally accepted, than the Mawli to actually bring that about. So please, when it comes to this event, remind people that we are not turning away or averting the real crisis in our Ummah in the form of Daesh, in the form of the extremists on both parts. Those who are basically ripping up the Qur'an and Sunnah because they think that we have to be a bit more apologetic and conforming to what the Westerners want us to think. Take out Surah Tawbah from the Holy Qur'an, Allah Akbar. Change our syllabus. Come into our madrasa and see whether Namaski Kitab or Yassal Qur'an is, a, a, is good for our children or not. The only way to combat this is to truly believe that Islam is the answer, it's not the problem. Muslims are the problems. Islam has always been perfect. And coming back to some of these episodes, that there was a spear of Islam and a spear of Muslims. In the past, those two spears, they were totally interlocked. They were totally eclipsed. They were part and parcel. Muslims and Islam were exactly the same thing. Today, and we have to explain this, is that unfortunately, Islam and Muslims are two different entities. Muslims say one thing, Islam says another. So please, in, in, the, in the midst of the crisis that unfortunately we are facing, do not forget that the Mawlid it plays a very, very important uh, role. Uh, one last uh, thing, that the paper that I just delivered, it is on the uh, uh, internet. Um, if you go to a uh, site, uh, it's called islamiccenter.org. And this is our mosque here in, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, Leicester. And each and every uh, month we do uh, a study circle. And what we do then is we add the uh, talks and we add the... Um, papers uh, for it, uh, on it. So the history of the uh, Mawlid, it is on there. Just type it at the top. There's a search facility there as well. So this, along with a lot of other information uh, about Islam, there's a paper on the history of the Mawlid, uh, sorry, much of the Nabawi as well. There's a paper on Daesh as well, the misconceptions of Jihad, Umar bin Abdulaziz, Karbala, so many different uh, papers. Do please uh, have a look uh, at that. Jazakallah khaira for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us and uh, increase our love through the means of the Mawlid, Ameen, wa ma alayna illa al-balaqul mubin. Find me that word. You won't find it there. Find me the word Tawheed in the Sihai Sitta, meaning the six most trusted Hadith compilations. It would be very, very difficult to find it. Imam Bukhari has included a <coughs> chapter called Kitab al-Tawheed as a, as a Hadith scholars, but you won't find, very difficult to find the word Tawheed from our Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam. So what are you going to tell me now? Are you going to say to me that there is no concept of Tawheed in Islam? So it's very important that sometimes the phenomena exist before it is named. Tafsir, usul fiqh fiqh all of these kind of terminologies, even tasawwuf, they existed long before they were actually given that formal title. Just because it wasn't named the Mawlid, it doesn't mean it was actually uh, in existence uh, before that. Um, what I'm going to depend on primarily in this uh, program is a beautiful book that I stumbled across. It's called Tariq al-Ihtifal bi Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's written by an Egyptian scholar called Muhammad Khalid Sabit. And in the title it means Tariq al-Ihtifal bi Mawlid al-Nabi means the history of celebrating the Mawlid of our Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. It's a beautiful book, it's in Arabic, and what he does in this book, he charts the history of the Mawlid, and then in detail, the first part of the book is talking historically, and then he brings it bang up to date. And what he does in, in considerable detail, he talks about how in modern days, the Mawlid is celebrated in Egypt, Turkey, Pakistan, Sudan, Yemen, Tunisia, Morocco, Palestine, Jordan, Libya, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Malaysia, Ethiopia, Balkan states, Russia, Nigeria, Mali, Kenya, Spain, Ukraine, Holland, China, India, United Kingdom, Canada, France, Denmark, Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, 
Bulgaria, Italy, Ireland, Australia, Greece, Senegal. ഹമീദ്ലീമ <coughs> Uh, respected uh, Shuaib Saab, um, the members of the Medina Society here at the University of Manchester, brothers and sisters, uh, my sincere thanks uh, for this invitation to speak, uh, inshallah ta'ala, today about the Mawlid al-Nabi sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. It is a, an honor to be here and inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to take about 30 minutes of your precious time and after me, inshallah ta'ala, there are two um, esteemed speakers who will be speaking after me. Uh, we have uh, Alama Shabir Siyaldi Saab and we have Imam Adil Shazad, uh, two individuals who come from the same mashrab as me, who have studied in the same institutions as me, two individuals who I respect daily and I am sure that uh, you will certainly learn from them. Um, in terms of the sequence, I think it makes sense for me to speak first uh, because I think it will be an ideal background and a good uh, backdrop uh, in a sense. Uh, to upon which Alama Shabir Siyalbi Sab and Imam Adil Shazad can speak about. Today, inshallah ta'ala, what I want to speak about in particular is the history of the Mawlid al-Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. And as far as I understand, uh, Alama Shabir Siyalbi Sab will be speaking, um, again historically as well, about how previous communities, they all tell Indonesia and the United States. So he's given individual chapters on all of those countries that I have mentioned. So proof if any were needed, that the Mawlid is truly a universal, uh, universal event. The Prophet ﷺ said, Yadu Allahi ala al-jama'ah. That Allah's assistance and his hand is upon the jama'ah, meaning those who follow the majority. The Prophet ﷺ said, Len yajtami'a ummati ala dalala. That my ummah, they will never agree upon something which is misguidance. They will never come together on a matter which is uh, disputed, you could say. They will, the majority will always follow uh, what everybody adheres to, which is part of uh, Sunnah. And one final point I'll mention about this book, he's written a beautiful line at the uh, um, front, almost like a subtitle. And I think this perfectly epitomizes the whole point of the Mawlid. He writes in Arabic, مَنْ لَمْ يَفْرَحْ بِمُحَمَّدٍ لَمْ يَرَى فَرَحًا عَبَدًا Whosoever does not show happiness for the sake of Muhammad, he has never seen real happiness. Real happiness is the happiness for the Prophet If you cannot show happiness for the sake of Sayyidina Rasulullah, who done so much for you, then who are you going to show happiness for? So certainly I think this is a great line which uh, uh, epitomizes and symbolizes the whole purpose of the uh, Mawlid. Um, so I'm going to give you three or four historical accounts of how the Mawlid started, so we can have an idea of where we can actually trace it back. And when I mean that, I mean in a formal sense. In a sense where the state, for example, would be sponsoring it. I'm not talking about individual Mawlids that you perhaps might see in the homes. We're talking about uh, the Mawlid en masse. We're talking in a, a, in a very uh, large scale. Then the second part of the program, I'm going to look at the Hijaz in particular, meaning the Saudi Peninsula. That let us have a look over the ages about how the Mawlid, or whether it was actually marked in the Saudi Peninsula, in Mecca and in Medina in particular. Today, unfortunately, they have a very different stance, but let's also celebrate the appearance and coming of our Prophet, peace be upon him. And then Imam Adul Shazal will be speaking about the purpose of the Mawlid and how we can take uh, benefit from it. Uh, from the onset, I'm going to make it clear, I'll give you an idea of uh, where I want to take the program is that basically all I want to do is to give you a very historic and uh, academic stance on where the Mawlid actually comes from. 
So I want to share with you some of the earliest accounts from the Muslim Ummah of how they celebrated the 12th of Rabi al Awwal and indeed that entire month. What I'm not going to do, and this is almost a disclaimer, is I am not going to actually talk about the legitimacy of the Mawlid. So it's not going to be an argument for why we should celebrate the Mawlid. It's not, I'm not going to go into detailed proof from the Qur'an or the Sunnah of our Messenger, peace be upon him, to talk about why Mawlid is right, why it is not bid'ah, and why that is actually part of our religion. As far as I'm concerned personally, this is a foregone conclusion. I think Mawlid for a long time now has been more about debating whether we should be doing it rather than actually doing it. Uh, in Egypt, uh, I, I lived in Egypt for three years and uh, there was no discussions on that. They just got on with uh, marking it. There was no parameters of debate when it came to whether we should be doing it. Happily and joyously they just marked the, uh, the Mawlid of the Prophet <coughs> the Prophet himself fasted on the day that he was born on Mondays. The companions talked about his seerah. The main argument, and, and I'll move on quickly, I'll just mention this, the main argument that people use as a form of uh, a propaganda is that they say, find the word Mawlid in the Holy Quran. Find the word Mawlid in the seerah of our Prophet That you can't find any proof and you can't find any evidence that Mawlid should be celebrated. Surely, if it's so important, then the Prophet would have said, you must celebrate the Mawlid. To which I answer, then fine, I'm happy with that argument, find me the word Tawheed in the Qur'an. Let's look historically <coughs> as to how they actually treated the uh, uh, Mawlid. And then, inshallah ta'ala, we will conclude with some words about the Mawlid today and how it is marked throughout the uh, Islamic uh, world. So, but to begin with then, we will talk about the first real account of the Mawlid. It's the the Fatimids, they ruled Egypt from the middle of the 4th Islamic century until the end of the 6th Islamic century. For most parts, and there's no disagreement in this, the Fatimids, they were Shias. And so they controlled large parts of Egypt and large parts of North Africa. During this period, certainly there are many reports which suggest that they commemorated the Mawlidun Nabi, alayhi salatu wassalam. So, for example, there is a very famous uh, historian, his name is Al-Makrizi, in the year 517, that's the Islamic uh, uh, date, he says and he witnessed firsthand as to how the Shias and how the Muslims of the Fatimid era, uh, the, the state would distribute food, they would give sadqa to people, and they would give the money to the trustees of the Mizars, for example. So the first real account that we have about the Mawlidun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes from that early period and as you can see we are only talking about 300 odd years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, passed away. Another uh, report um, is taken uh, from the Fatimid era is that sweets would be distributed. All people would gather at al Azhar University which is the, perhaps the oldest uh, university in the Islamic world. Um, then they would proceed to the government palaces, listen to speeches but um, one observer, Dr. Abdul Muni Masultan, he notes that for most part, these celebrations, they were Shia in nature. So for some observers and some academics, the Mawlid, it actually has Shia uh, heritage. The origins of it are to be, uh, you could say, from the Shia, not from the Sunnis. However, the author of this book and certainly other mainstream scholars, they assert that you cannot say,